that uh, God is manifesting himself in different ways, uh, but it's not, it doesn't mean that there's more than one God. Uh, so I, what I want to make sure we clear up immediately is that we're not talking about anything like something, some polytheism, that's not the case. Uh, we're not talking about uh, modalism where God is switching between uh, being Yahweh or being the angel of the Lord or being uh, the word. Like we, that's not what we're, what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about is the fact that there is a, uh, a, a distinction between the visible God and the invisible God. So that's, that's kind of the framework that we're going to be working in. And, and the visible God, I'll go ahead and give, a, give it away up front. When we talk about God being visible, coming in the form of either the angel of the Lord or either the word, uh, that all of that points to Jesus. Uh, and so as long as, and that's the framework that we're working in, but in the Old Testament, Christ hadn't yet been revealed. So we have to understand that when these different typologies are introduced, like the word, like the angel of the Lord, like the commander of the Lord's army, all of that, when that's introduced, we have to understand that those things are uh, foreshadowing. They are pointing towards the New Testament, pointing towards the coming of Christ, who is Yahweh in visible form, right? Um, so we, we're going to start with, let me put this in presentation mode. My computer has been acting real funky today, so pray for that. Um, Come on, PowerPoint. It's coming. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, that in terms of uh, Abraham. Let's start with Abraham. <clears throat> and if we look at uh, the book of Genesis and the 12th chapter, that's when Abraham was, was called out of Mesopotamia. Uh, to be a vessel for God's use. So let's look at that real quick. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, sorry, because he changed his name later. But the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And then verse 2 says, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and, and the one who curses you, I will curse. <clears throat> and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says in verse four, and Abram went forth as the Lord has spoken to him and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions uh, which they had accumulated and acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. So God calls Abraham out of Haran, which is a part of Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia. But, but scripture also indicates that God appeared to Abram. If you look at Genesis 12, 6 and 7, let's go down to there. Uh, it says, in verse verse six, Abram passed through the land as far the, as, as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moray. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. In verse seven, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your descendants I will give this land." And then it says, "So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him." So God shows Himself to Abraham here in this scripture, and. If we look at Acts 7, when Stephen gave his speech before he was stoned, Stephen even indicates that God had dealt with Abram prior to him coming to Abram and saying, leave your land. So let's look at that, Acts 7 and verse 24. If I can get to it. Acts 7 and verse 24. Let's, I'm sorry, not 24, 2 through 4. It says, I'm going to start at verse one. It says, then, then the high priest said, <clears throat> are these things so? And verse two says, and he said, hear me, brethren and fathers. 
the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Following. So this is Stephen giving an indication that Abram saw God before God had, had talked to him in, in Genesis 12, before God ever spoke to him, before he ever appeared to him. He appeared to him another time while he was in Mesopotamia. And it says, before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Verse four, then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran from there. Uh, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. So scripture tells us that, that Abraham and God had dealings before God ever told him to leave to leave where he was and go to the place where I will show you. So there's a pattern of God visibly manifesting himself early in the Old Testament, right? You know, Adam and Eve were in the garden and they obviously saw his form. Uh, and then later on when, when in the Old Testament, when uh, Enoch was taken up into heaven, uh, obviously he saw something Right. And so all of this is a pattern of, of God manifesting himself, especially with the patriarchs like Abraham and like Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all of those. And, you know, who who would be leaders in Israel. And one of the things that, that we have to understand is that God has to uh, basically attenuate his glory, put it on mute uh, so that. Abraham would be able to stand being in his presence. Same with anyone who was in his presence. All the prophets who were in his presence fell on their faces. Any uh, Anyone who came into the presence of God not only could not stand to see his glory, but they had to be invited. Even Moses, when he went into the tent, everybody couldn't go in. But God manifests himself visibly to those whom he chose. So let's go and look at um, Genesis 15, because again, this is a manifestation of God to Abraham, and he is manifesting himself so that Abraham can visibly see him. And in Genesis 15, this covenant ratification, because God makes the covenant in, in Genesis 12, but in 15, he ratifies it and he cuts the covenant. Uh, that's literally what that word means. It means to cut, right? And so in Genesis 15, we see some uh, another manifestation of Yahweh to Abram, but it's not Yahweh himself. Rather, it's the word of Yahweh or the word of the Lord. So look at Genesis 15. Let's look at verses one through six. And it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, that's that's the key, and that's the catch right there. It says, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, right? So this is a yet another manifestation of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord, manifests himself to Abram in this covenant ceremony. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Verse two, Abram, Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, and Abram said since you have uh, given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. And he says in verse four, then behold the word of the Lord again, that, that's that manifestation again the word of the lord came to him saying this man will not be your heir but but one who will come forth from your own body he shall be your heir and verse five says and he took him outside and said now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them and he said to him so shall your descendants be then he believed in the lord and it says and he reckoned it to him as righteousness and verse seven says, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So again, you see now a different 
a different slant because it says now instead of the Lord said or the Lord appeared to Abram, it says now the word of Yahweh or the word of the Lord appeared to Abram or came to Abram in a vision. So what we take away from that is that when if the word is showing up in a vision, that means that the word has to be visible. It's not just audible, right? It's not just God speaking, but it's, it's, it's the word as a manifestation of Yahweh, right? The word is a manifestation. And when we look in the Old Testament and look at when it says the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, so we know it's visible and we know he was able to hear because and see because they're having a conversation. Yeah, uh, Abram is saying, God, I don't have an heir. Who's going to be my heir? And so now, and the word speaks back, right? It says, then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir. So we see a back and forth dialogue. And all of this, again, is a visible manifestation that Abram can actually see and hear. And so what, what this points to is Jesus. It is, a, it is a visible manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament. And we know that is the word Jesus in the New Testament who makes God known to man or visible to man. So let's look at those scriptures real quick. Uh, let's look at those uh, scriptures real quick. So we looked at Genesis uh, 15, one through six. Let's look at John one and one. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? And so you see that equality. The word was with God and the word was God. So that equality between God and the word, that's important because one of the things that the author tries to do in this chapter and the next, in the chapter following is to help us to understand that it is the word as a manifestation of God. The word is also God, right? There is equality between the word and Yahweh, all right? So look at John 1 and 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Look at, um, and it says, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. So we see that the word is equated here with the son who we know is Christ. John 1 and 18, no one has ever seen God at any time. God, the only son. So there's that equality again between the son and the father who is in the arms of the father. He has explained him. John 8, 56 through 58. It says, your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day and he saw it and rejoiced. Right. He saw it and he rejoiced. And it says the Jews said to him. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was born, I am. So how is it that Jesus can say that he, let me go back. How is it that Jesus can say that he saw Abraham? Unless we understand that when the word of the Lord came to Abraham, that was a prefiguring of Jesus himself, right? They said, you're not 50, but you, you've, and you've seen Abraham. They asked this question, have you seen Abraham? Incredulously, like, there's no way, you're not old enough. So not only... Uh, was Christ there in the time of Abraham, but we know he's also pre-existing. He's eternal, right? He doesn't, he doesn't have a, uh, a date or time on his life, his, his spiritual life. We know in the flesh, he came, he, came, he was born to Mary. Uh, he was born in a manger. He was born in Bethlehem. We know all of that, but that body was just a casing for the eternal God to show himself, Right? Colossians 1 and 15, talk, also talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And don't, don't twist that up, that firstborn. 
That does not mean time. That, that word prototokos literally means preeminence, right? He is the first over all creation. And we know that Adam was created first. He was the first man, human that was created. So this is not talking about time, it's talking about preeminence. And it says he is the image of the invisible God. Uh, the, the book of Hebrews in chapter one says that he is the exact representation of his glory. Uh, and he is the, he is the, um, expressed as the radiance. He's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his likeness. All right, John, first John one and one. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, right? So again, in the Old Testament, when you see the word of Yahweh or the word of the Lord, we can look at that as a uh, post, a, a, a mile marker on our way to the New Testament pointing to Christ. It is a, uh, it is a prefiguring of Jesus. And then we can deduce from the word that his that 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 is the Yahweh in, in his visible form, and that again Jesus is the Word. We've seen that in John one eighteen and Colossians one fifteen, and then God again has to attenuate His glory in, in order for humans to see God in a perceptible form. He has to dull down His glory to ensure that those who see Him will survive. Uh, Moses asked in, in Exodus 33, he said, God, if I found favor, I'm paraphrasing this, if I found favor with you, show me your glory. God said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I'm a hydra in the cleft of the rock. I'll make all my goodness pass before you, but you can't see my glory because no man can see my face and live. So anytime we see in the Old Testament where God manifests himself to a human being, uh, it has to be in a form that they that human beings can perceive and understand, right? That, there's, that we can't comprehend God in his full glory. It's not possible, not in our human form, all right? So let's look, I made a chart and the chart is actually in the handout just to kind of tie things together. So Abram saw God in, in Genesis 12. He saw God in Genesis 15. The purpose was, first of all, to set the covenant. And then the second time he saw him in 15 was to ratify the covenant. And was the, the, the top of the chart asked, was God perceptible? And the answer is yes. He was visible and audible, right? He was seen as the word. And he was also audible. Abraham could hear and he could see God. Uh, and again, in Genesis 18, 1 through 5. We're going to turn to that real quick. Uh, Abraham it has another encounter with God. And in, in Genesis 18, uh, Abraham is not, is not startled. He's not shocked uh, when he saw God. And the reason is that uh, God had already been dealing with Abraham, you know, throughout his past. Right. So we look at Genesis 18, one through five, it says again, now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent uh, tent door in the heat of the day. Verse two, when he lifted up his eyes, he looked and behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. And he bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord, if I found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under, under the tree. And I will bring you a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you visited your servant. So Abraham is, again, he has this encounter. He's able to visibly see God. And in this particular case, it says that there were three men. One of them had to be uh, Yahweh, because at verse one says, now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of memory. So one of those three beings had to be Yahweh. So was he visible? Yes. Possibly in human form? Yes. And the reason he came was to reveal the plans uh, for Sodom and for Gomorrah. And in the process prior to that, God also promised him Isaac, his son Isaac. Um, 
you also see a, a manifestation in the book of first Samuel. Let's turn to that real quick. First Samuel, uh, chapter three. First Samuel chapter three. You know Samuel's story. Samuel was, his mother was barren and God allowed her to have a son and she brought Samuel back to the temple to the priest Eli and dedicated Samuel and let Samuel stay there. And so Samuel uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter three is called to be a prophet. And if you look in at uh, chapter three, verse one, it says this, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli and the word from the Lord and word from the Lord was rare in those days, days, visions and frequent. So that Samuel was called to be a prophet at a time when the word of the Lord was not going forth. Uh, it was rare and visions were rare. And it has, says, verse two, it happened at the time Eli was, was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was that the Lord called Samuel. And he said, here I am. And then he ran to Eli and, and said, here I am for, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, lie down again. So you know, um, you know the, the story, Samuel, God calls out to Samuel more than once, called him again. And in verse seven says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So he had never heard God's voice. He had never seen God. He had never seen the word. And so Samuel, uh, in verse eight, it says, so the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you call me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. It shall be if he calls you that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in this place. And then it says in verse 10, then the Lord came and stood. So now he's making himself visible to Samuel. He came and stood and he called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And it says, the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears uh, of everyone who hears it will tingle. And so Samuel saw the Lord. He saw the, a visible manifestation of the Lord because it said the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. So he showed himself to Samuel. And he also showed himself to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah uh, verse chapter one. Uh, and we're gonna, not gonna read all nine verses, or all 10 verses, but go to Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah chapter one. Come on, Russell, get it together. Let's go, let's start at verse four. Uh, Jeremiah chapter one, verse four. It says again, now the word of the Lord. So you see again, the word, the word is showing up. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, now here, here it is, Jeremiah, uh, is being called again, called to be a prophet, given his mission. But he says, the word says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And, and it's important to understand that we don't take what this says and just say, oh, he just heard the Lord. Because whenever a prophet spoke, it doesn't say the word of the Lord came to the people. It says the prophet came saying as the Lord declares or as Yahweh declares. So it's different when the word is being spoken as opposed to when the word actually is visible and shows up. So it says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So the word has creative power, obviously because the word is saying to, to Jeremiah, I formed you in the womb and I knew you. So the word is omniscient. And it says, and before you were born, I consecrated you. 
I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And then, and then we see here in verse nine, then the Lord stretched. So you see how the text shifts. The word is there now it says then the Lord, but it's the word that actually shows up. So you see that equality. It says, then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth, right? So when Jeremiah, he heard the Lord, he saw the Lord in the form of the word. And not only did he see the Lord, but the Lord interacted with him by touching his lips, right? So that was a tactile uh, interaction between Jeremiah and the word. So all of this is just, again, it's, it's, it's repetition and it's repetitive, but it is repetitive with a purpose. Yahweh manifests himself as the word, but the word is not another God. The word is a manifestation of the one true God. And so you have Yahweh invisible, and then the word is a visible manifestation of Yahweh. He's not switching modes. He's not changing roles. They are two distinct things, but they both have the same nature. And they're both representations of God, right? All right, let's go to the... Uh, so now that leads us into the discussion about uh, the Godhead. Because really, it's not necessarily about um, the names, you know, the word, the angel, or whatever. It's about the visibility. And anytime we see that God makes himself visible, what that points to, again, is Christ. Because it is Christ who made Yahweh known to us in visible form, in bodily form. All the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in Jesus. That's what scripture tells us. All the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in Jesus. And so it's, it's not necessarily about the different names or the different ways that, that God manifests himself visibly. It's about the fact that he is indeed visible. That's what all of this is pointing to. All right, so, so the God, let's talk about that because what we get from these scriptures and from the fact that Yahweh shows up as Yahweh or he can show up as the word is the idea or the concept of uh, what theologians call the Godhead, right? We know now that the Godhead consists of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that those three persons comprise the Godhead, each one equally God, each one has a, having a different role in the history of mankind, uh, each one participating in the works of the other. So three concurrent works going on at the same time, right? Christ came to save, the Holy Spirit is used for sanctification, the Father sent the Son, but they all participate in each one of those works, the, the uh, sending, the salvation, and the sanctification of humanity, of those who are saved, all participate in each one of those works, right? So uh, that's the, the Godhead is an idea, but we know where the idea comes from is the fact that God manifests himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I even posted a handout from a, a previous Bible study that we did dealing with the Trinity, right? And you'll, you'll see people say, well, the Trinity is not the word trinity is not in the bible and that's true it's not the word itself is just a way to express the idea because god is a unity in that the father the son and the holy spirit all exist in concert they're all unified in their efforts and they all make decisions together right there's no decision ever made in heaven where the Son or the Holy Spirit is going to disagree with the Father and vice versa, right? So the, the word of Yahweh and Yahweh are found together in a lot of places. We're going to see that in a second, especially. Uh, and, then, and then we're also going to see in another place where the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are together. So the point is that Yahweh can manifest himself however he chooses. Um, 
but the but the language indicates that God can be in heaven and on earth at the same time, and that's on purpose. There's a reason for that, right? There's a reason why the lines are blurred between uh, the Word and Yahweh Himself, and that's because the identities are the same. The nature is the same, right? And it's not polytheism. The Jews of uh, Jesus' time, they understood this, what, what the author calls Benetarian concept of two Yahwehs, one visible, one invisible, one in heaven, one on earth. So the idea of the Trinity then is not far-fetched because even uh, in the Old Testament, there's much evidence in scripture that, that suggests that the, the Holy Spirit also was present in the Old Testament. The reason why we don't see the Holy Spirit as much in the Old Testament is because the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out among men. The prophets even prophesied about the Holy Spirit. Joel prophesied about the Holy Spirit being poured out. But the reason we don't see it as much in the Old Testament is because the Spirit of the Lord has not had not been given to man. That happened at Pentecost. But let's look at um, let's look at uh, the Book of Judges. Let's look at several scriptures from the Book of Judges. Uh, and, and again, the, when we think about the word Trinity, that has nothing to do with, uh, some people use it, oh, see, uh, they made somebody, the Pope made it up or somebody made this up and this is not real. It, it, it's, you're not gonna see that word in scripture, but you will see that concept, that idea and the three persons of the Godhead all throughout scripture. You see the Father, you see the Son, you see the Holy Spirit all throughout scripture. So it's not about somebody making something up. It's not about Christianity being a ruse or being used to manipulate or dupe people. That's not the case. The, the, the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father are all God, and they're all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's look at Judges 3 and 10 because, see, this idea is not far-fetched, right? Because the Spirit of the Lord is mentioned in the Old Testament. Judges 3 and, and, and distinct from the Lord himself and the word and the angel of the Lord, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, but look at Judges chapter 3 and verse 10. I'll read verses 9 and 10. It says, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer uh, for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Uh, his name was Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Verse 10. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave Cushan, let me make sure I pronounce this right, Cushan Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia, into his hands so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So again, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, did not live in him, right? That, is, that does not happen until after Pentecost where the Holy Spirit lives in us and indwells us. But he says the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Judges 6 and 34. Judges 6 and verse 34. Look at what it says. It says, so, this, I'm going to read 35, uh, 33. It says, then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Jezreel. And verse 34 says, so the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the, let me make sure I get that right, of these rights, the of these rights were called together to follow him. Right? So again, you see with Gideon, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. So that, 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 there's no way that we could deny that the Holy Spirit is not present in the Old Testament. The difference is that the timing and the season that the Holy Spirit was given, that didn't happen until after Christ came. That was on purpose. Jesus, when he talked about himself, he says, when I go away, the comforter is going to come. That's God's timing, right? God, God operates on a, on a uh, not a schedule, but he operates on a, in a system. He had a plan from the very beginning, right? And you can look all the way from, uh, from Genesis with the patriarchs. You can look at Moses. 
And you can look here at the judges, the kings, all of these things happened on purpose. All right, so let's look at uh, Judges 11 and 29. Judges 11, verse 29. It says, uh, now the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he went on to the sons of Ammon. So again, you see the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. So the spirit of the Lord is present even in the Old Testament. So the idea again of a Trinity or a Trinitarian uh, concept is not far-fetched. You see Yahweh, you see types of the sun, right? Typologies or prefigurings of the sun and the angel of the Lord and the word, right? And then you also see the spirit of the Lord present even in the Old Testament. Uh, 1325, Judges 13, verse 25. Let me find that. It says 25, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir. It's talking about Samson. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him uh, in Mahana Don between Zora and Eshtaol, right? So again, this is not a far-fetched concept. And it's not something that, you know, Constantine made up, which is something you'll hear all, a lot of. Oh, Constantine made this up. And it's not something that the Pope made up. It's scripture. And it's right here in the Bible, right? But the point is, all of this is pointing to the, the visibility of God. The fact that God shows himself as himself, Yahweh, the Father, the Almighty, and shows himself as the Word, and shows himself as the angel of the Lord, and shows himself, you know, in other forms, means that he expresses himself in three persons. You can see the spirit, you can see prefigurings of the son, and you can see the father expressing himself in, 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 you know, as three entities, but still one God, right? One God who exists or expresses himself in three persons. All right. Um, we got, let me see, we got some time left, but I really don't want to start the next section. But we can we can touch the next section, but we won't finish it. But I'll pause right here. Are there any? Does anybody have any questions or comments uh, about the section that we just covered, and the fact that God made Himself visible to Abraham? He made Himself visible to Isaac. Made Himself. You're going to see in the next section. He made Himself visible to Jacob. He made Himself visible to the prophets. Uh, and this is and and many times He showed up. He showed up as the Word of the Lord. Right, that's the point. And the word is a, again, a visible manifestation of God. All right, any questions or comments? All right, uh, we, we'll, we'll start, we'll, we'll probably just get through this slide and uh, let me see what's coming up. Yeah, I don't wanna, yeah, we'll do, we'll do, uh, Genesis 22, and then we'll stop there. All right, so it says uh, this, and th again, this is another chapter, another section. Uh, but we talked about like these ideas of a Venetarian, two Yahweh's, one in, one in heaven, one on earth. It kind of made it easier for <coughs> Jews in the time of Jesus to accept the fact that God could show up in human form and, and the disciples did and those who believe they actually accepted that fact that uh, God showed up in human form. Uh, we talked about the word as a visible manifestation of, of Yahweh, but it's one of many manifestations as that's what we're gonna see here uh, because another manifestation is that of an angel or angel of the Lord. It's not saying that God is an angel but when he showed up in the form of the angel of the Lord, that angel was God, right? So there's a difference because we know that angels are low on the totem pole uh, and human beings are right underneath them, right? Because scripture says that God made us a little lower than the angels. So based on the Old Testament 
scriptures we see that God exists and I'm not saying at least because if we limit it to the Old Testament we see that God exists as as at least two equivalent persons one visible and one invisible and again it's not polytheism it's just the fact that God chooses to manifest himself however he chooses and our limited understanding of God is uh, just that is limited right and so what what God is capable of our understanding to grasp it is often limited. So we want to look at one other uh, passage of scripture and it's in Genesis 22. And this is God again, showing himself to Abraham. Uh, but this is in a different context because now Abraham has been asked to sacrifice Isaac, take him up on a mountain, basically slit his throat and set him on fire as a burnt offering. Uh, I know it sounds crazy and bizarre, but I mean, it's right here in scripture. Uh, but the, but the, the term, ain't the angel of Yahweh, appears uh, in three different places in Genesis. In Genesis 16, and you can look at that, because I, I want to hit those, we'll hit them the next time, but I want to hit them now, because you know then we'll go, be way over time. Uh, Genesis 21 and 17, and also in uh, 22, verses one through nine, which we're getting ready to look at now. Uh, but Genesis 22 is different from the other two passages in 21 and 16, because there's a, there's a line that gets blurred so that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are, the identities are identical, right? There's, there's two persons, but they have the same nature, same identity, they're equal, and they're both speaking in first person as if they are Yahweh, right? So let's look at that. So Genesis 22, uh, verses 10 through 18, right? But well, we're gonna, let's go here. So I have it here. So it says, and Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But, and this is the catch, and I have the pieces highlighted that kind of point to this line being blurred between uh, Yahweh or the Lord and the angel of the Lord and it says but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am and he said do not reach your hand out against the boy and do not do anything to him look at what it says for now I know this is the angel of the Lord talking now I know that you fear God so the angel of the Lord right there is equating himself with God I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me, right? So you see right there, the angel is a, a, a visible manifestation. We're going to see that in other texts, that the angel is visible, uh, but also equal, right? And then it says in verse 13, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son, verse 14. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by, now this is the angel acting as the mouthpiece of God. By myself, I have sworn, notice the language, declares the Lord. So now the angel is speaking to Abraham, but now he's speaking as a mouthpiece for Yahweh. And it says, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as, as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. So you see that there is a distinction, that there are obviously, um, there are obviously two entities in this text, the angel of the Lord or the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh himself, the Lord himself. And if you look back at the, at the beginning part of that text, what you see is the angel making himself equivalent with Yahweh, 
right? Saying, I'm God. I, I know now I know that you fear God. And he says, Now I know that you fear God. And then he says, You have not withheld your only son from me. Right? So that's that's indicating equivalence. So, and then when you look at the, the text. Abraham is not taken aback by the voice of the angel of Yahweh, right? It's not like he heard a different voice. Oh, this, this is something different. Who is this speaking to me, right? If you notice when the angel spoke, Abraham said, here I am. And so again, one in nature, the same nature, the same God, right? Just visible in a different form. Then in, in, in 11, the, the angel spoke in, in verse 11. And then the, the text swaps between the angel and the one who made the initial request, right? When, when it says declares the Lord. So there's a, there's a blurring of the distinction between the two. And that's on purpose because the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of the Lord. It is not the angel of the Lord. He's not, uh, a second God, he is the Lord in this form. All right, does that make sense? Anybody, everybody following that? I think we're, we're going to pick up next week. We're going to talk about some other manifestations as the angel of the Lord with Isaac and with Jacob and uh, with uh, there was one that was one other uh, person that we're going to talk about, but we're going to stop right here. Uh, Cause I don't want to go too much further cause it's, it, we're already over time. Um, but are there any questions or comments from this section? I have a comment on it. I think that goes to show just how important it is to know the Lord and be able to recognize his voice because mm -hmm. what if he had hesitated? Absolutely. Your son would have been sacrificed, but you know, I just, that's what I think is just so, somebody shared a post the other day and it was like, you know, we have a habit of praying to God, praying to God and talking to him. It's like, be sure you be still long enough to know when he's answering you too, when he's speaking to you and you can recognize that it's him. Right. Right. And, and, and another thing uh, that's really important in all of this is the fact that I mentioned it at the beginning, I'm saying it again now, the fact that it will be Israel who saw Yahweh, and it will be Israel who, and the patriarchs who will see him and be able to pass down that history to the other tribes and to all of the, all of the other uh, peoples that, that made up that nation. It will be Israel and the patriarchs that was able, will be able to pass that down, pass it down from generation to generation to generation so that they would know the one true God and know his voice. So yeah, you're right. You have to you have to know who's speaking because if this study hadn't taught us anything else, it taught it it's taught us that there are other beings that exist that have voices too. Right. So we have to we have to be able to recognize the voice of God. And Abraham recognized that here, did he not? Right when the, when the angel of the Lord called from heaven, it wasn't a different voice. It was the same voice that he had already been hearing because he said, "Here I am." Not startled, not uh, questioning. He just said, "Here I am," because he knew. And that is important that we know his voice and that we know uh, when he's speaking to us. And one of the things that I always say and I always will say is that God is not going to tell us anything that's going to contradict his word. He's not going to tell us anything that's going to be contradictory to his word. Yep. Any other questions? That, that's, thank you for that comment, Sister Yvette. That's, that's what I was right on time. Right on time. A any other comment or, or question before we close out? All right, if not, we're going to close in prayer.